right, uh, so let me turn off my video so we can just focus on the presentation. <clears throat> So we've been doing these uh, series of seminars for our upcoming event, which, uh, let me just show that here. Definitely sign up for the uh, uh, SolidWorks Career Fair. This is something that we've been working on for quite a bit now since, uh, I think, before the beginning of, uh, of this year, uh, just throwing some ideas around. And we wanted an opportunity to have uh, our SolidWorks students, you know, as students, we use the tool for school for different, uh, just for different classes. And eventually, we end up using this or similar tools in, in industry. So uh, there's always a need to have someone with sharp SolidWorks and CAD modeling um, simulation skills in industry. And so what, what better way to do it than right before graduating and and making those contacts. So this is something that myself, I, I didn't get an opportunity to do starting off, and I wish I had uh, known about some, some of these resources we have available at ASU just to be able to talk to, to different people. And um, engineers, we, we, we want to share what we do. We're really excited about our projects, and um, the community is a great place to, to meet uh, upcoming engineers. So so definitely join us next month on the 26th and 27th. And uh, yeah, just meet some of our employers out there. These are all uh, Go Engineer customers that use SolidWorks for their designs, and they're excited to meet you guys. So definitely take advantage of that. All right. So again, I just a little bit about uh, who I work for here before we get started. I work for Go Engineer here out of Arizona. And for those of you that, I, I know some of you guys may have already seen some of our other seminars, but if this is your first one, uh, and if you're not familiar with Go Engineer, uh, Go Engineer is a reseller and resource of many engineering tools that are pretty essential to, to many industries. Uh, we offer solutions that include 3D CAD modeling, like SOLIDWORKS, like we're going to see here. Um, let me get rid of this uh, whole deal there. Uh, also, uh, data management tools like we saw with uh, with Jake's presentation yesterday, um, additive manufacturing like FDM, metal, stereo lithography, 3D printing, just to name a few. Um, and we're currently doing our part in keeping with uh, social distancing and safety. And we've been doing all of our communication through virtual conferences and Zoom meetings daily uh, since uh since the beginning of the year. Uh, we, we've also extended uh, all of our training resources. We, we Not only do we sell and uh, uh, support all these tr uh, simula uh, simulation and engineering tools in general, uh, we train all of our customers um, on the proper ways to use them. So you guys are going to get a taste of how we train with SolidWorks simulation here in the seminar. Uh, but we're also, we've been diligent this whole year, and we've created over 25 new courses uh, throughout this whole, since this pandemic started in February. Um, I myself have been, I'm working currently on my fifth self-paced simulation course at the moment. So we've definitely uh, taken advantage of this unfortunate situation, and, and we still want uh, the quality of our content to, to go to our customers and, and students. So, um, so we're, we're trying our best here. Um, also, I was remembering just coming back, uh, being a student and not knowing much of what was to come in a professional sense. So uh, if you guys have any questions uh, or in general have any work-related questions about engineering or, or need advice, uh, don't hesitate to, to ask here on the chat or, or in the questions. Uh, we've definitely all been there. So, All right, just a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Enrique Garcia, and I'm one of the simulation specialists here at Go Engineer. Um, I'm an ASU grad, I graduated from the bioengineering department uh, a few years ago now, and um, I've been, I learned SOLIDWORKS just uh, from the prestigious school of hard knocks, just kind of playing around with the tool on my own. I uh, needed it for a couple of classes, and I really needed it for our capstone design, senior design course, uh, a senior year, and I really started to not just play with the tool, but start using it for 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 courses and for for my project, and um, really got a, a taste for the simulation side of things. I started playing with some of the the basic simulation express tools that we have, um, and did a little digging with uh, CFD a little bit, uh, and then graduated and uh, ended up getting a job uh, as with one of the resellers uh, here in in, the, in Arizona, and I've been doing it ever since. I really enjoy it. I've been teaching SolidWorks uh, for the first couple of years, and then I started teaching simulation to use my degree, uh, started teaching flow simulation, plastics, uh, 
and I just uh, I like learning and learning about new tools and new industries. So uh, this kind of gig just really res resonated for me, and um, I really enjoy what I'm doing here. Uh, so I've been doing uh, s um, technical training for 13 years with SolidWorks and then simulation. Um, I've been I've done many different roles. I've done roles where I've done technical support for our customers. Uh, I've done uh, demonstrations. I got to chance got chances to go out and meet uh, different. Uh, different customers and to see their products firsthand out in the field. It's been a very, very fun adventure uh, teaching and training and, and doing this whole reseller network with SolidWorks and other products. Um, have many nieces and nephews and I have a robot dog, which uh, we're going to learn a little bit about later on in the seminar. His name is Diode and he's pretty awesome. I have a real dog too, Oliver, and he's, he's equally great. Um, and uh, I love making toys and gifts for family, and this has been a, a great lifesaver for me during quarantine. Uh, let's talk about the seminar here. So this is the agenda for today. We're going to be giving you a foundational um, uh, education on simulation. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, what what is finite element analysis, the overall pra uh, practice, uh, what is done in industry versus what we do in SOLIDWORKS and, and some of the benefits that we have. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, some prerequisites that you may need to do for running studies and simulation. Uh, we're also going to then go in and uh, do a, a uh, we're going to show you a little workflow um, using a simple part file and we'll do a little static study. We'll set it up, run the study, look at some results and show you the more popular results. And then we'll jump in and talk about contacts. Contacts, I think, is one of the more um, important, uh, essential type of um, setup constraint that we can do in SOLIDWORKS simulation. If you don't have your contacts right, then your results are going to be incorrect. So uh, a good foundational knowledge, uh, working knowledge on contacts is very important. So we'll cover that. We'll do a, a little workflow with assemblies. And uh, then we'll finish off by um, by, by uh, going through some best practices and tips and for both contacts and simulation in general. So uh, this is just a, a, let's say a slide of just an overview of some of the different capabilities with simulation we have available. So uh, the majority of what you will be seeing here is going to be using the uh, SOLIDWORKS simulation interface, which is what you see there under SOLIDWORKS simulation. We have things broken down into different tiers, and as students, you have access to all of uh, whatever, you, what to the entirety of what you see on the screen here, from simple static structural analysis to high-end nonlinear dynamic optimization analysis. Um, we have access to fluid dynamics with our flow products. You can do HVAC electronics cooling, uh, and you also have access to plastics. So you can do mold making uh, simulation as well. So you can go in and inject your hot melt. You can have access to the database of uh, different machines. Uh, you can give it the, um, the specifications needed to uh, inject your hot melt into your cavities uh, and get uh, residual stresses, uh, deformation, etc., from these different tools. Tools. So again, just a quick overview of the capabilities you have uh, as students uh, at ASU. All right, so what, what is uh, SOLIDWORKS simulation? So <clears throat> it's essentially a, uh, a numerical method that we use in solving structural vibration and thermal problems uh, for your designs. Uh, the nice thing about this tool is that it's fully integrated inside of SOLIDWORKS. There's no need to install a separate uh, software and export from SOLIDWORKS, then import into the other software, run your simulations, export it from that, and then import it into a post-processor. So that, that's kind of what the industry uh, uses for some of its tools. Uh, it, it likes to piecemeal out different tools, whether that's um, <clears throat> how you mesh the model and set up the different nodes of calculations to what solver. There's a full industry of different solver types to, to run simulations that you can purchase. And then there's also other uh, offerings for, for post-processing, for creating graphs, for creating um, trend graphs, for creating numerical graphs, for going in and probing the model and picking up the, the data that you've, you've solved from the solver. All of that is usually typically um, separate when you, uh, when you purchase software. With SOLIDWORKS, they've combined, it, they've combined all these facets of the simulation process into one inside of the SOLIDWORKS ecosystem. 
So it's nice that you can go in, build your model in SolidWorks, turn on the add-in for sim, run your simulation, look at the results, and if they don't look right or they, you need to make a change to the model, just click back on the SolidWorks tab and you can make your change, add your fillets, go back to simulation, and iterate over and over again. It's super powerful. Um, something else I want to mention besides the ease of use is that uh, we, as you saw earlier, uh, we, we do have, um, the simulation is a high-end analysis tool and offers a lot of the, the same sophistication uh, compared to other high-end tools like ANSYS or Abacus. Uh, but again, it's much easier uh, to use. Uh, the tool is going to guide you with the use of uh, design trees. Uh, if you're familiar with how to design in SOLIDWORKS, a lot of that translates very easily into simulation with uh, SOLIDWORKS. All right, so I, I mentioned a little bit about uh, the, the process for running a simulation. So there is a, uh, a process that we use to go through the, the different steps in running through simulation. So we start by uh, first pre-processing the model, and that, that includes uh, simplifying your model. So if you're out in industry, uh, typically you have a design team that goes through and designs the model for manufacturing. Right? And then they give it to the analyst, which will be you guys. So you'll take the model, and you don't want to run the simulation on the model as is with all the detail. That's going to just take a lot of computational power and resources. So as an engineer, you want to go in and figure out what parts of the model are essential for the structural response and get rid of all of the extra minutia of details, like small fillets, small... Um, uh, small embosses or the logo and things like that. You want to get rid of all that. So you're only left what's for what's with what's important for your actual analysis. Um, some techniques you can do for that is you can make a new configuration in SOLIDWORKS for your parts. Let's say you're doing a part file, right, and you're having to simplify that. Well, in the, uh, in the configuration manager, you can go in and start a new configuration or another version in the same part file, and then go to your tree and then just suppress all the small detail-oriented features that you're not going to need for the, for the simulation part of the analysis. This way you're keeping things separate. Um, another uh, thing that is popular in industry is if you're working with what we call a live model, so a model that's maybe currently in production and needs to be refined somehow and that's your job, well, uh, a good idea to do is uh, to go in and do what's called a pack-and-go. Uh, pack-and-go ba will basically take a model that is made up of different parts and an assembly and will copy the whole system of parts and assemblies to a new location with new file names. This way you're separate from that live data and then you can do your simulations on that. Uh, if you're not familiar with uh, SOLIDWORKS Pack&Go, just go to the help menu or Google it and there's a lot of good information on Pack&Go. It's one of the um, the safest and the most powerful ways to copy a whole system of files without messing up all the references, which can be frustrating, especially if you're new to, to SOLIDWORKS. Uh, what else? Uh, with pre-processing, uh, another thing that you can do, um, actually, let's just, let's talk about, um, so that's the pre-processing, that's kind of what's involved, right, is getting your models set up and ready for the simulation, and that includes not only the, the simplification, but it involves uh, adding and creating your study, setting up with your forces, your fixturing and, and contacts, and meshing your model. So the meshing of the model is just applying all the nodes of calculation uh, inside of the volume of the model, and uh, and that all takes uh, that's all encompassing the one step of pre-processing. The second step is the solution. Now, like I mentioned earlier, the solution is just hitting the run button in SolidWorks. But in industry with other softwares, uh, you can purchase other so other solvers, and you can then export that whole setup into the solver, and then run it there on that other software and and process and calculate your your models. So that's why it's a separate step. And then the third step is the post processing or the interrogation of your results, both qualitatively and quantitatively. So um, in SolidWorks, again, it's just after it runs, it just spits out the, some default plots, and then we can continue to make new plots and interrogate the, the results we have there. It's all <clears throat> kind of meshed together. Uh, in industry with other softwares, it's with other, um, with other products, it's a, a separate software that you then need to import your solution and data into and then post-process to get plots and graphs and, and uh, localized uh, results. 
So that's kind of the, the general workflow is you set up the model, uh, you prepare it and set it up, then you run the study, and then you post-process and look at the results. As far as the pre-processing, I mentioned a, a little bit about the, the first here, the, the defeaturing, which is a simplification of the model. Uh, there's some, uh, there's two other facets that I like to bring up here in this particular slide. In addition to the defeaturing that we mentioned, there's uh, something called uh, model idealization. And this is uh, taking complex pieces of geometry and replacing them with more simplified versions of it. You can kind of see there on the screenshot down below here what I mean. Uh, another example could be, uh, let, let's say you're doing like a like an environmental or HVAC uh, te simulation test on maybe a classroom with a bunch of computer towers, right? Well, instead of running the simulation on the models with all the details, with all the, the buttons and the air vents on those computer towers in that room, just get rid of all those computer tower, uh, towers and replace them with simple blocks or, or rectangular extrusions with uh, maybe similar mass or whatever you need. This way, you're not going to worry about in calculation of, of all that little extra detail. So again, that's, that's what we call idealization. It's just the replacement of those more detailed models with simpler models. Another thing that we can do in, in simulation is that we can replace those uh, with what we call virtualized uh, mathematical models. For example, if you have an assembly and the assembly has many different bolts and nuts and screws, well, th those extra uh, details on those nuts and screws with the threading and, and all, uh, it takes a lot cal of calculation time. So we can actually get rid of them and suppress them in the simulation and apply mathematical models called virtual fasteners uh, to do um, maybe 95% of what the actual screw would do in the simulation. So we have that kind of capa uh, capability in SOLIDWORKS simulation uh, to idealize uh, complex geometry. And the last one is um, maybe not important for us as students, but out in industry, sometimes we work with um, models that come from other CAD packages. And when we import geometry from other CAD software, we sometimes have what we call translation error, which means sometimes we may lose a, a face of our model, or maybe an edge doesn't nicely match up to another square edge on our design, just because of the way that the, the modeling kernels shifted and, and translated the data over to SOLIDWORKS or vice versa. And then we have to do what we call model cleanup. Um, and uh, this could be time-consuming. So, so just be aware of that. We have that uh, aspect of pre-processing is just uh, cleaning up your models, uh, going in there and um, using surfacing or patching of the model is going to be important. Um, I guess in closing with this whole, uh, th this whole particular slide, uh, if you don't do any of this or don't think about or address any of these different items, this could, this could definitely increase your calculation time on your simulation studies. Um, uh, it could have cause meshing problems uh, or just a general higher probability of problems in simulation errors in general. All right, a quick slide about the mesh. So I mentioned that in pre-processing, in that stage, we have to mesh the model. And that just in layman's terms means you're taking your design and adding three-dimensional calculation nodes within the whole volume of your models. So we can do this with three types of meshing styles. Basically, when you apply these calculation nodes, um, they connect each other um, into little units called elements. So by default, uh, if you have three calculation nodes, they're going to want to combine to create a tetrahedral shape, like kind of like how you see there on the lower left, uh, the lower right hand side of this of this slide. So it's going to want to do this, and it's going to want to connect all the dots together into this little mesh of tetrahedrons throughout the entire volume of the model. And these are our solid elements. Now, if you have a model that's very thin, like uh, maybe think of sheet metal uh, parts, right? If those are very thin in one d dimension and then very thick and potentially very thick in the other dimensions of maybe height and width, um, if you're wanting to go in and fill in little elements, solid elements, it can be, you can, you can spend a lot of your resources just on filling in thicknesses of very, very thin pieces. So that's not very reasonable. Uh, so for that, we can use shell elements like you see here in the, the orange bit of the slide. So that basically meshes or samples a two-dimensional 
uh, element or entity, and then in the setup of the study, we tell it what the thickness is. So we idealize the thickness of the, of the element um, in the study setup. The third type of element uh, that we have are for uh, models that are very, very long. Um, think of telephone poles, think of bridges, I-beams, C-channels, things of that nature. Things that we can uh, we can build in SOLIDWORKS with weldments uh, are going to be uh, wanting to default to beam elements. So these consist of two endpoints, two calculation nodes on the ends, and then a simple line segment uh, that's going to that's going to connect both uh, both of these of these uh, these calculation points. Now the cross-sectional area is taken into account with these beam elements. So you can uh, you can potentially mix all three of these element types into one master model that you're creating uh, when you're running your simulation studies. All right, and one more slide here before we do a little bit on um, a case study here together on the screen. Uh, this is super important. Since we're going to be working with uh, static studies, we need to understand some of the assumptions uh, that we need to make uh, to validate the, the, the idea of using a static study. So depending on the type of simulation we're running, we have different uh, environmental conditions. And so for simulation static studies, these three assumptions are essential if you're going to be running this type of study. So if you see here on the screen, we have, uh, if you've taken material science uh, in, uh, in school here, uh, you're probably familiar with this particular graphic of the stress-strain curve. Basically, if any, just picture, picture a paper clip, and if you bend the paper clip a little bit, right, and then you let go, it bounces back to its original shape. Well, that particular bending that you're seeing there, that, that elastic deformation uh, is following Hooke's Law, which is what you see there in red, that's been highlighted in red. And that's where we live when we do static studies in simulation. Now, if I take this hypothetical paperclip and I bend it a lot more and a lot more until eventually you feel it give, right? And then it actually bends and it permanently bends when you let go. It bounces a little bit, but then it, it pretty much plastically deforms and permanently deforms in that shape. Well, that's our nonlinear uh, response of that particular material, and that's beyond the capabilities of the static study that we're going to be using. Now, that's not beyond the capabilities of the tool uh, for simulation. If you need to sample and uh, simulate that plastic deformation and that large displacement, then we have nonlinear uh, nonlinear studies that we can run to uh, fully um, simulate those situations. So for us, we're sticking with the um, Hooke's Law, uh, or our linear response of our models. Now, the second assumption kind of goes hand in hand with the first, right? If you have a, a, a linear response, you typically have a small or, or minimal displacement that occurs at the model. And that's something that the software will actually grade for you. It'll, it'll look at, if you apply a force load and you hit the run button, it'll look at the overall size of the model and it'll calculate a projected maximum displacement. And if that ratio is acceptable and it's small enough, then it's gonna say, yeah, we're good to go. It's gonna, it's gonna go ahead and proceed with the calculation. Now, on the other hand, if it looks at that displacement, that projected displacement, and if it happens to be pretty significant compared to the overall size of the model, it'll give you a little warning message, which I'll show you later on. But that just tells you, hey, you may want to consider doing a nonlinear study if you're doing larger displacements. So the tool is very, very user-friendly, and it gives you good feedback. Uh, the third assumption is going to be the, the fact that we're doing a static study, so our loads have to be static. Um, so in this case, we don't have inertial forces in a static study. If you did have a situation where you wanted to do impact forcing uh, forces or just in general uh, take into account inertial forces, then you would do a dynamic study and simulation instead. So these three assumptions, um, if uh, you can say yes to all of them, then we're good to go to use a static study. All right, let's jump into our first case study here. So for our first case study, um, this is uh, Diode, the uh, Sony IBO. So a little, a little background about uh, Diode here. So when I was uh, a young kid, um, I saw on television the Sony IBO. Does anyone know about these uh, at all? Has anyone seen them on TV or anything? Um, basically, it's uh, it's a robot dog that uh, was pretty advanced for the for the time when I was growing up, and I remember asking my parents uh, for a robot for the Sony Ibo, and they're like, "Yeah, sure, yeah, we'll think, we'll think about it for Christmas, yeah, yeah, yeah," but they didn't realize, and I didn't realize that these things were like thousands of dollars, and and um, they're considered, I guess, an entertainment robot, which 
in layman's terms means an, an adult toy. So so definitely within not within the price range for me as a kid. Fast forward years later, I'm all grown up. I'm on eBay. And I just look up these uh, these robot dogs, and I saw a gentleman out of Japan who was refurbishing these older dogs and getting them um, to 100% and reselling them on eBay. So I uh, contacted the guy and uh, felt good about what he was up, who, what he was about, and ended up buying one. And it was it was a dream come true. It was awesome. It was a childhood dream come true. And I was showing him off, and I had him in a some some sort of sit down mode. And he actually um, got out of sit down mode, or maybe it was my mistake. And he fell off a little ledge I had, and and I was devastated, but super excited at the same time because he did break. But now I got to a chance to, or a reason to open him up and kind of, uh, you know, examine the inner workings. I'm a tinkerer, so uh, I ended up doing it. I got the courage, and I opened him up, and I saw that he broke his neck, and I, I fixed that. I fixed the, uh, a plastic piece. I did some epoxy on him, but uh, inside there was a, a little uh, a, a, a yaw plate that moves his head left and right that just snapped in half. You can see that on the screen there. So I thought, okay, I super, I tried super gluing it there. You could see that didn't work. It, it just, uh, the, the ABS plastic was too slick and uh, it just wasn't working. I was figuring, okay, maybe I'll just do epoxy just to finish it off and, and, and fix him. But then I thought, well, I have SolidWorks and I have a 3D printer. Why not just reverse manufacture uh, a replacement? I, I, looked, uh, I looked up for replacement parts and they're nowhere to be found. You have to buy a new or a broken dog to replace a part. So that wasn't realistic. So I ended up um, reverse engineering the part in SolidWorks with, um, with some pictures. I used uh, SolidWorks sketch pictures. If you guys are interested in this technique, look it up on YouTube. Uh, there's uh, some tutorials I bet out there for it. You're basically taking nice orthogonal pictures of your parts, and you're importing those pictures into SolidWorks with some uh, dimensional references, and then you're just designing off of those references, and that's what happened. I think on my second revision, I got the dimensions spot on for what I needed it for, and uh, started running a uh, diode again and to 100%. And uh, it's been uh, about two years, and he's still going strong. And so after I got him fixed, I was thinking, okay, well, is there a way that I can maybe optimize or um, improve on the design? Maybe I can 3D print a, a better part for this, and maybe uh, you know share it with community or whatever. So I start. I did some simulation, and so that kind of led to this case study. So we're going to be going in, and we're going to set up a model that I. We're going to recreate the setup that I did for a, a simulation I ran for this guy, and um, we're going to look at some results. So this is the part, and the idea here is we're going to be fixing the model. So whenever we run a static study, we have to stabilize the model somehow if we're going to be applying a force load to it. If we don't, then the model is going to be affected by the force, and then the part's going to fly out into space, and then you're going to get an error message. The calculation will become unstable, and you'll get the error message. So we're going to be applying this fixed geometry on the, the end that engages with the head of the model so that the, the robot dog can move his head left or right. And then over where it says roller slider and the, that cylindrical peg there, that fits in that housing that kind of rotates around. So it needs to, to be able to, to float around on that cylindrical face, but it can't go up and down. So we're going to be applying some constraints for that. We'll be applying a uh, ABS plastic as well. And then we're going to be applying a, a torque, a torque load. So the torque load for me was uh, an educated guess. I just decided uh, the, that the robot dog weighed about four pounds, so he actually fell a, a small distance. So I just bumped that up to maybe um, to six pounds, six pounds four inch. So that's that was my my educated guess on this. Again, um, so again, it's all, it all depends on what uh, what your best guess is on these things. Um, so I did that, and then we're going to go in and discretize the model, and we're going to be applying some calculation nodes on it. And then after that, we're, we're done, and we're going to run the calculation. So let me open up SolidWorks here, and we'll, uh, we'll jump in. And we'll do the setup. So here's the model that I made in SolidWorks for, for Diode. And so the first thing, if you're new to SolidWorks simulation, you have to make sure that you turn on the add-in for SolidWorks. For this, you're going to go into the little add-ins. You can go to Tools, and then you can go down to Add-ins. Or my favorite way is a simpler way is just to go to the little gear icon for options and hit the pull-down menu and then go to Add-ins. 
again, you'll find there's many different ways to do the same thing in SolidWorks. That was really um, kind of intimidating for me learning the tool way back when. Uh, but just if you see a way that you like, just pick that one and stick with that. There's many different ways to use the tool. So uh, that's the reasoning behind that. So there's my add-ins. And under the SolidWorks simulation, I want to make sure I have the add-in turned on. And if I use this tool a lot, I can turn on the add-in at startup. Now, for those of you that have computers that maybe are lower power computers, I know as a student I had a machine that wasn't ideal for SolidWorks. I would recommend that you look at all of your startup column add-ins and turn off everything you don't absolutely need and then turn on things that you do need later on. So maybe for this, I don't need flow, right? So I can turn off the, the add-in at startup here and during my session of flow right now. So I definitely want just the simulation add-on turned on and it will turn everything else off and click OK. Once you have the add-in turned on, you'll have a dedicated simulation tab in this command manager of SolidWorks, and you have a dedicated window at the very top here under simulation. Under simulation, just to let you know we have some options I want you to be aware of. Under the options menu, um, I recommend going into default options, just perusing here just to see, make sure that you have the, the, the units that you want to use. Uh, I like to work in megapascals and SI units. Uh, I recommend under results, this is pretty important, I recommend under the results folder that you turn on use uh, under subfolder and give it a name. So what this does, without this, the, without this option on, when you hit the run button, simulation just um, throws all of the simulation results, uh, uh, the, the result files and the support files all in the same directory where your model is, right? And if, you, if you've noticed that, and then you have just extra stuff that you have to manage in there. So with this checkbox, it adds a nice little folder where it then throws all the stuff in there to kind of organize it a little better for you. So that's my best practice with this options area. Everything else, uh, definitely explore. The help menu for simulation is phenomenal, just like the SolidWorks menu. Uh, you can go in here and uh, just look up all kinds of things and uh, the software will go in and uh, give you some examples. Uh, it'll give you some videos. It's been pretty nice. Uh, so here's some video uh, or GIF files. It's again, highly um, developed and, uh, um, and it's, it's a great place for, for learning how to use obscure options and settings. So I'm just gonna back out of there. And again, that's the simulation options menu. It's a, a different option set from the SolidWorks menu options. So I'm going to go in and start a new static study. I'll go up and click new study and I have different study types here available and depending on the licensing, which again as students you should have pretty much everything you see here on my screen. If you don't, then you may have a licensing issue that may, you may need to resolve with uh, the ASU IT department or anything, something like that. But in general, you should have everything here as a student. And uh, let's say I give this, uh, I'll just call it static one. So I'll have a static study, click OK. And you're going to notice that we have a new tab that shows up on this lower left hand side of SolidWorks. And this is where you live when you're doing a, a simulation study. So we have our dedicated simulation design tree. And let's say for any reason you're working in simulation, you needed to make a change in the CAD model. I recommend just exiting the, the static study, going to the model tab. This will just kind of conveniently hide all the simulation tools out of the way to keep things separate. Just because it's so integrated, it can be a little confusing. So as you're starting off, this is what I recommend you do. So you go, you'll go and you work on your model here. You can suppress things. You can add holes or whatever you need to do to change your model. Once you're done, go back to that study you were working on and those changes will just be there and then you can apply the new fixture or the new force and then run the updated study. It's that simple. So for the setup here, I like to go from top to bottom in our little simulation design tree. So I start from the very top here, which is our solid body. And this is how we assign a material to the model. So I'm going to go in and right click and say apply edit material. And this will open up the SOLIDWORKS materials library. Now this library is the very same library we use when we assign materials in SOLIDWORKS. So if you're familiar with that, then then great. You don't have to learn uh, this new this new this new interface. Um, if you're new to it, this is this kills two birds with one stone. So you'll go in, and the same thing goes if you're doing SOLIDWORKS. Let's say I, I, I exit out of this, I go back to the model tab, and if I go over here and I look at the material, I can right click and say edit material. It's the same database. 
So that's how you add it here at the CAD model. But if you want to add it specifically in the simulation to run this simulation specifically, just do it here. And for us, I'm going to go in and I'm going to be, uh, this is an ABS material. So I'm going to go under plastics and pick our generic ABS material. We have our material properties here. I want to hit apply and then close. That's step one. We know that we've completed this. We have a little uh, green check mark indicating that we've applied the material. We're good to go. Next, I like to address connections. So if I do a right click, uh, we can see some connection types available. This is this area is how we relate this particular model to other models in the assembly. In this case, we're not going to worry about it. We only have the one the one solid body, so we're actually going to skip this particular folder. We'll come back to it with the next case study. So next, we're going to be addressing fixtures. So fixtures is a way that we limit degrees of freedom in the model and how we stabilize the model. So if we have uh, this particular component, like I mentioned earlier, if I apply, let's say, a force load on this surface and I force it in that negative Z direction, it's going to float out into space and you'll get an error message. It'll destabilize the calculation. We don't want that. So we're going to be assuming that these three little, um, these holes in the model, this is how we uh, engage the, um, the this little this little bracket to the head of the little robot. So for our purposes, since it's static, we'll just say that those are our fixture point. So we'll do a right click here and we'll, I'll go in and apply a fixed geometry. And I'll pick those inner cylindrical faces and then the inner faces of the slot. We get nice little feedback with our symbols. We'll click, we'll click OK. And then we'll continue on. Now I'm going to limit the um, the, the degrees of freedom along this little peg here of the model. Um, if you remember uh, from that first screenshot, this particular model kind of plugged into a little housing, which allowed the uh, this particular part to be the pivot, and then the bottom would basically rotate the left and right to move the head. So we need to give it that kind of limitation of the degrees of freedom along the peg here on the top. So I'm going to go right right back into fixtures, and we can do that with maybe a fixed hinge, or there's many ways to, to approach limiting degrees of freedom. So I'm gonna show you a couple that maybe are a little bit different, but if you if you ever play with this tool, uh, try them out, go in and, and check these out. So you can go in, maybe go to advanced fixtures. They're really not that advanced, they're just extra. They're just another, it's another category. So what I like about the way fixtures is shown in the UI is that we have a GIF file that we can click on to see what kind of limitations and the degrees of freedom I can expect from the different tools. So for example, under fixed hinge, if I choose a cylindrical face, it'll it'll add a um, just a, a virtual a virtual hinge there for me. For us, maybe I want to go in and apply a uh, maybe an uncylindrical face on this face here. And let's say that down below I want to limit the I want to limit basically the translation, right, of the Z direction here laterally and vertically. So for that, I want to do radial, and then I want to leave that at zero. If I enter a value, I'm forcing that face, uh, in this case, radially outward, which I don't want to do. I just want to freeze it in its spot radially from moving, so I'll leave it at zero. Now I have other degrees of freedom, which I'll leave open for now. If I, if I don't turn these on, then they're just free to rotate and, uh, and translate actually up and down. So for now, I'll just leave that as is. And if I'm adding a couple of these uh, in, in models, you can you can do hundreds of these different fixtures depending on the size of your assemblies and models. So a good tip here is to click this little keep visible icon. And then when I click OK, it'll add that fixture and it'll reset the interface to add the next one. So maybe for this new guy, maybe uh, I want to do a, a roller slider for the top. So maybe I'll go over to the standard, I'll click on the roller slider flavor, and now notice the GIF file. This is what I can expect on the, the target face that I'm going to be choosing. So for us, I'll pick the top face there of the, the peg, and that's saying that I can let it translate left and right, which again, I'm constraining with the previous constraint, right? But for this rule, I'm telling it to not move up and down. So again, um, I guess I the one thing I can say is pay attention to your symbols and look at the GIF files for, for clues as to how the degrees of freedom will be limited using the different fixture types. 
and, and play around, explore, uh, you, uh, model simple shapes, and see what happens when you play with these guys. Eventually you'll figure out how they work, and that makes you a powerful analyst with simulation. So we'll accept that, we'll click OK, and we'll click the Cancel button there just to close out of the UI. So I've applied a couple of constraints, and now we can see some changes in the SOLIDWORKS simulation design tree. I can see I've added the fixture, the cylindrical faces, and the roller slider condition. And if you're familiar with SOLIDWORKS modeling, this works kind of in the same way. I can go in there and I can hide and show the individual symbols. I can suppress the individual constraints and items all within the tree. And more importantly, I can edit these guys. I can go into my original fixture, right click and say edit definition, and it'll take me right back and I can add new faces, remove faces that I've mistakenly added, whatever you wish to do to edit your fixtures and your constraints. So all that is just common knowledge that comes from working with SOLIDWORKS into simulation. All right, so that kind of takes care of the degrees of freedom for our model for this particular piece, so I'm going to rotate the model around. I'm going to be applying that torque load we, we reviewed. So for this, I'm going to go under external loads and choose torque. And for this, just for the sake of picking the faces, I'm just picking these larger faces. And uh, we'll just say that these faces engage the servo, which I'm sure the smaller ones do. But again, just uh, we're starting off with something, and then we can always iterate later and make changes. So I'm picking all of those faces. And down below here, maybe I want to enter, uh, let's change the units to IPS. And let's say we, we said six uh, pounds, I think, force inch. And uh, if you needed to change the direction of something, uh, or I, I, I probably need a reference here. I want to pick a, a reference for my torque. There it is. It's going in the anti-clockwise direction. If I needed it to change, not that it would matter here, but if I needed to change in the other direction, just click the reverse direction checkbox. Again, some of these options are pretty, pretty straightforward. Uh, once you're done, click OK. Oh, and one more thing. I mentioned about the help menu. And so let's say that you didn't know what some of these different symbols and things meant or options. I could click on a little shortcut to the simulation help menu, and it will take you to the article dedicated to that particular little property manager or set of options, so you can read on what the, what the option was that you had a question on. Super, super helpful. That's how I learned how to use a lot of these tools in SOLIDWORKS and in simulation. Let me click OK, and that applies our torque. Uh, one more thing, I want to, to I want to double check here. So, under torque, and this is a good exercise in going back and looking at your models. I'm going to right click and edit that guy, and I want to go in and I want to make sure that I'm doing uh, six uh, units per uh, in total for all surfaces. Right, the way I had it set up is per item, and that would add a lot more, a larger magnitude overall. So, again, one of these things that could happen. Uh, you're going to look at your results, and you're going to say, that does not look right. So then you want to go back and review your setup, and that's a classic mistake. All right, we'll, we'll make sure that says, is set to total, and I'll click OK to update that in my definition. Uh, at this point, we're pretty much done. I want to go in and mesh the model, and all that is is going into the mesh folder here, clicking on Create Mesh, and going in and picking maybe a, a type of mesh. We have three different ways that we can mesh the model. We can do a standard mesh, a curvature-based mesh, and a blended mesh. If your models are prismatic and very blocky, I recommend using the standard mesh and just putting in the element size. And you have a little tolerance here in case the mod, so you can kind of fit in uh, a note or two, a little extra on the end to the model. Um, or if your models are very organically shaped, or you have the potential of changing the model to something that has a curve to it, uh, then I recommend the curvature-based mesh. Um, as a best practice, I always use curvature-based mesh, even if a model is more on the prismatic side, just because I, if, I, if I know I'm going to be adding a hole on it or a, a fillet, then the software will then tend to go in and apply uh, fillets uh, that are maybe smaller, and I can add and see a little more resolution in those areas with a, a little tighter mesh in those models, in those areas of the model. So because of this, we have a maximum and minimum range for the element size. So it'll ping pong between the two ranges, between the, 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 uh, the max and minimum range of the, of the element size. 
And then we have a newer approach, which is called the blended curvature-based mesh. It basically uh, mix, takes the best of both worlds. It lets you go in and um, it lets you use a standard mesh on models that are blocky. And then it'll give you a nice little boundary where it'll shift to a curvature-based mesh. And then it'll, it'll go in and do the max and minimums for that. So for me, for now, I'm just going to go in and choose a curvature-based mesh, go to Fine. And um, I mentioned at the beginning of the seminar here that when you're working with a model, you want to you want to prepare the model. Maybe start simple with simple choices for your things. Um, one of these choices can be the mesh quality of the of the model. What I mean by that is, if you remember when we apply calculation nodes through, throughout the entire model, it connects the dots to make little tetrahedral shapes. Well, those tetrahedral shapes will have calculation nodes on the ends of each tetrahedron, and by default, it'll also add calculation nodes on the mid nodes as well, just to add more detail and more places to calculate the model to get more results. So what I recommend, and that's called mesh quality. If you click on mesh quality, this is what you get. This is what I mean by adding those mid nodes. Now, I recommend if you're if this is your first pass on your model, you basically want to set up the model as simpler, simple as possible uh, with, and you want it to run as quickly as possible just to get to a point where you have some results. And then you want to go back and add more detail to your model. That could mean maybe adjusting the way I applied the torque, like I mentioned here earlier. Maybe apply friction on different contacts or, or add custom materials if you know that your model uses a specific material um, of plastic instead of the generic ABS. And this also includes the mesh. I can go in and switch it from maybe the draft quality mesh, which is what I'm going to be doing now. This removes those mid nodes. And maybe later on, I can switch it back and I can do a high quality element, a mesh with high quality elements to re-include those elements to add more detail in the calculation. So that's kind of the, the take on how you can approach um, growing your simulation studies uh, in simulation. For now, I want to keep it simple. So I want to go into draft quality mesh and click OK. We'll mesh the model. All right. At this point, we're pretty much done. A good, uh, I'm ready to run the study. Now, before I run the study, I highly recommend that you save the SOLIDWORKS model. Can't stress that enough. If you don't, um, will it run? Absolutely. Uh, however, if you have a situation where maybe your model is quite large and you have a lot of calculation nodes and maybe your simulation starts to, st starts to run and it realizes that it doesn't have enough resources to run, you may need to exit the, so the software. And you know, I'm just talking about from experience with a lot of engineers throughout the years uh, and you may lose your work if you haven't saved it, right? And this includes the setup. So it's always a good idea before running a simulation study, save your, save your models, and then we'll run the study. All right. So after running the study, in those simulation options I showed at the beginning of this case study, um, you have an opportunity to pick your default uh, plots. If you leave them like they are at default when you install the simulation software, then this is what you get. You get the von Mises stress plot, you get a resultant displacement plot, which takes all the component uh, displacements and um, does some vector math and adds them together, and you get the resultant displacement, and the same with equivalent strain. Now here's, I'm going to be reviewing, there's a lot of different things you can do to interrogate results. I'm going to be reviewing some of the more popular and, uh, and useful uh, ways to show plots and work with result plots here in simulation. So the first thing I like to do is I like to edit the definition of the plot. Now you can see here that if I look here at the very top left corner of my graphics area, I have some information. It's telling me that I'm looking at a deformation scale of the model or an exaggeration of my displacement while while displaying stress, and that's displacing a, a little over 10 times the actual displacement. So uh, what I can do here is I can modify that. I can right click on that plot and I can go to edit definition. And here, not only can I change the units, maybe I want to choose PSI or KSI, depending on the scale of your results. Uh, I can go in and make some changes to um, showing different components. If I had multiple components, and I can choose and change it from uh, an automatic scaling uh, to the true scale or a one-to-one -one scale of what is actually happening. So this way, you can see that the model isn't really deflecting too much um, before it's before it maybe snapped in my real-life scenario. 
So th that's one place that I like to modify. And again, that's right clicking and going to add definition. Another thing that I like to do, and actually let me change this back here to automatic, is I like to go to chart options. Chart options, I can call out maybe a maximum or minimum call out so I can see what my stress values are. Um, this is another place to go in and help interpret the results. So a, a big part of this as uh, being an analyst with simulation is looking at the results, but knowing what they mean, that's up to us. The software is going to just spit out what it shows. It's up to us to tell the story. And that for us means, does the model displace? Is it yielding? How do I want to show that? So a, a good way of showing if a model is yielding is by showing more red, right? Uh, that's intuitively, that's, that's, that's bad. So in this case, maybe I want to show a little more red. The maximum stress is about 20 megapascals. So if I want to show a little more red in that area to accentuate that, I can uh, decrease the range of my color of my color bar of my plot. So I can go into my maximum value here, and maybe instead of doing 20, I can do maybe 15 and lower that. When I click OK, I can see that I'm now showing everything from blue to red, and everything that's approaching red and above the red, which is 15 megapascals, is going to be red. So again, you're helping to tell the story and helping to interpret the results for your viewer. And again, all these settings all apply to the other plots as well. I can just double click to activate all the different plots. Some other things you can do with these is you can do an animation. This is super popular, uh, very great way to start maybe a, a design review with uh, your, your engineering team is showing this particular um, animation and saying, okay, what's wrong with this? How can we fix this? And again, we're exaggerating it. We're showing qualitatively how it's going to respond uh, so we can make some conclusions. We can save this out as an AVI file as well. Again, those can all be done. All these different interrogation techniques can be done in tools, can be done on the other plots. Another thing you can do is section clipping, which will basically let you section your result plot so you can see what happens on the inside. Um, a big aspect of a design is going to be failure on the inside of your model, which can happen. So super important to go in and interrogate your results within the thickness of your designs as well. Another very popular uh, tool we have for interrogation is isoclipping. Now, isoclipping allows you to filter your volume of your model based off of the result magnitude. For example, let's say I, I wanted to show I want to show what the results here look like uh, from 10 megapascals and up. So I can put in a value of 10, and now I'm filtering everything. Um, I'm getting rid of everything below 10 megapascals. This is great, especially if you maybe are looking for a, um, let's say, a yield, a yielded stress or a failed part or a, sp a failed volume of your model. Well, you can type in the, 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 v, the yield of that. Maybe I'll put in 13 or something, and then I can update it, and it'll show me everything above that cutoff, which if it's your yield stress, it's everything that's yielding, right? So it's a great way to go in and, and look for areas of the model that maybe with the full result set loaded will be difficult to spot and identify, but with the ISO clipping tool, you can zoom into small little spots that you may have to, to readdress or, or take a closer look at. It's a great way to identify uh, where you have failure. So that's ISO clipping. Uh, let's see, what else? Um, uh, the probe. So these are all been qualitative uh, approaches to interrogating results, but how about specific values? So yeah, we do have the maximum value, but maybe what if I cared about the result on this side of the model instead? So for this, I can use the probe tool. So to use the probe tool, we're going to right click and then choose probe. And now I can go in and pick a specific area of interest, move that away, and I can see a call out of what that result plot is going to be in that specific area. Wherever I click, the software will, will collect the node that's closest to my selection and display that particular node. If you happen to remember what the node number is, you can click on at node number and type in whatever you whatever that was, and then boom, you have that call out. And, um, something else you can do, let's say I click a couple of these calculation nodes, and down below, I get some statistical information, and I can actually graph on the fly those particular nodes in a graph. So again, we don't have to export it to Excel and do the whole graph generation. This is all automated using Excel right within SOLIDWORKS simulation. 
Um, well, here's, a, here's, I think, a more convenient way of doing that. Let's say I, I choose Unselected Entities, and then I pick up that particular edge. I click Update. The software is going to calculate and, and collect every single calculation node throughout this entire little selection edge. It gives me my statistical information, and I can also plot that. So I'm going to get this really nice little trend graph showing what that was. And it looks like, in this case, it's going from, uh, from left to right on the, on the graph there of what's shown on the screen. So again, this is uh, just some of the more popular uh, and uh, result plots that I frequently see inside of uh, reports that I, that I, that I um, help and I, I consult with for different analysts uh, in our industries. Um, another thing that I recommend is something um, that we use when, when we're generating a project. Uh, documentation is king, right? This is how we control and we um, we maintain a level of quality for our products. And well, part of this is something called a design history file. This is how we document all steps of the growth of our projects. And you can go in and create a little summary report of this exact simulation setup with the report tool automated in SolidWorks. When I click report, I can go through and look at the report sections and remove maybe sections that I don't care about. Uh, in this case, maybe contacts, right? We're not worrying about contacts here. Um, I don't have any sensors. And so you can go through and do that. And then I can hit publish and simulation will go and using a template that's been installed uh, during the installation of SolidWorks simulation, it'll just copy that and then um, make a nice little word file here. So I'm going to click, click, I'm going to click publish and I'm going to go ahead and automate and collect screenshots. I'm collecting information about the material, the fixtures, every single folder and constraint that we've done. It's going to make uh, screenshots and document all the settings that were used. So in the end, we'll get this nice little um, Word document report that has the screenshot of the, of the model. It's got a nice index with all the different sections all laid out, including the results and all the different um, uh, all the different settings that we used to recreate the model, and with this report, you can from scratch reproduce the entire study setup using this report file. All right, let's go back to our presentation. So in the end, this is kind of what we get, and we can see that my model correlates to the actual break that we that I saw, which was I was super stoked and happy about, um, just because it's, again, this gives me another example to show that the tools uh, can be applied to real world situations. And again, the, 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 one of the main messages here is, is looking at the assumptions, looking at the conditions of the environment, deciding which study is going to be the most appropriate to, uh, to apply the model to, and looking at your inputs. What is your force load? What kind of constraints are going to be reasonable to, uh, to simulate, to, to make it as similar to real life as possible? And then your results will follow suit. So I, I call it the garbage in, garbage out principle, right? If your, your results and assumptions are not correct and not, and not well thought out, then your results are going to reflect poor results and not be correct. And uh, here's the fix. So uh, at the end, uh, this was one of my prototype prints and uh, and tests that I did out here on the left and took a picture of. Um, and over to the right, you see diode. I'm testing his his tracking, and it looks like it's tracking, and his head is panning left and right just fine, and he's good to go. All right, let's uh, switch gears here and let's uh, let's talk a little bit about, we have uh, about 25 minutes left in the seminar here today, and I want to finish by talking about contacts. So assigning contacts is going to be, uh, contacts will be the most important and time consuming part of your study setups. Uh, there's no there's no question about that. Uh, whenever I talk to uh, fellow analysts, uh, if I have uh, clients that have trouble with their simulation, it usually boils down to contacts. If it's not other technical issues, then if it's maybe a, an education thing, it's probably related to contacts. At least that's the most popular source of error that happens uh, with simulations. The reason for this is because there's there's many different ways to apply contacts, as we'll find out. There's many different ways to apply fixtures as well, but there's many different um, 
places that we can apply contacts. Uh, and uh, it's important to address every single one. If you don't, then the model is going to make an assumption that you may not like or approve of, which will then snowball into results not being uh, correct or, or being deviated from the real world's uh, results. So contacts, again, is knowing how they work, knowing uh, what they are, how they're applied, and some of the governing rules are going to be important. That's what we're going to be covering here today in this section. So there are three types of contacts that we have available. Um, I like to start with the, the no penetration contact. The no penetration contact is going to be your most complex of the contact types. Uh, and it's going to take the most calculation time as it, it has to determine uh, when the model, uh, if you have a face on part A and face on part B, when they collide and they, they respect each other and they don't penetrate, well, it has to figure out what their reaction force is. It has to figure out whether one of the parts is going to slip and slide past each other. If they're both going to slide past each other, which direction? And will there be any rotation involved? Uh, will one of the parts uh, partially separate during the event? Uh, will it fully separate? Will it fully come back together? There's so many different combinations of scenarios that the software has to create a matrix for for those potential scenarios then solve then to solve the study. So again, um, the take home message is that no penetration contacts take the most calculation time because of all those those different facets of the of the type that it has to solve for. All right, the next thing is going to be um, bonded contacts. So bonded contacts work uh, just like uh, they sound, which basically the, the, you bind uh, different points, edges, and faces together. Um, and you're basically welding things together with bonded contacts. Now, the third contact type is going to be your allow penetration contact. So the allow penetration contact uh, eluded me for for a while when I first was new to simulation. Uh, and it's it's an it's an interesting type of contact because it's it I, I see it, it 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 does what it says it allows faces and entities to basically ghost each other and allow it allows them to merge purposefully into each other and this was very strange to me because that doesn't happen in real life right um, but after talking with uh, analysts over the years and coming to some conclusions with the development team it's used for a, a troubleshooting tool uh, for for working with more complex contact solutions or contact problems um, if you have a model with many facets that you say you want to have no penetration on it and you have another model that and they collide and then there's all these different no penetrating contacts because of now what you know about no penetrating contacts and all the different scenarios there's a lot of calculation that can propagate there and the software will uh, depending on the scenario may throw up its, may, may throw up its hands and say I'm done I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna fail and I'm out of resources I'm done a study failed so what you can do with allow penetration is take a complex model and take a couple or most of those no penetrating contacts, switch them to an allow penetration contact to a type to make them more simple, run the study, and if it runs fine, great, you're good to go. Then slowly add a couple of those allow penetrations back to no penetration to make the model more complex and do it slowly and kind of crescendo into the full model and then eventually you'll see where the issue lies and then you can make some determinations of what you want to do whether the model is too complex or whether maybe the material was uh, the, the incorrect material or fixturing so you can continue to troubleshoot. So again it basically helps you simplify your, your complex contacting problems. So those are your three types of contacts. Now there are three ways that you can apply these three contacts. The first way is globally. So if you have a model that has multiple solid bodies, the software will automatically just jump in there and apply your contact. It'll apply it to all the touching faces all together. The second way is a component level contact. So if your model is um, part of a larger, let's say a larger um, top level assembly and you have two components that you want no penetration, just pick the two components and every single face there will respect each other's faces for no penetration. And then you have locally applied contacts. So if you know specifically what surface or entity on part A will collide or make contact with face on part B, then choose those faces. This way you'll eliminate a lot of the extra calculation time that's involved and you're super specific. And so this is the kind of the, the dominance order, the, the, uh, the hierarchy that you see in the model. 
and again, uh, definitely take um, take a screenshot of this here if you if you if you can. And uh, this is, I think, one of the most uh, important. Uh, concepts in simulation is understanding the dominance order of contacts in simulation. All right, so we have about 15 minutes, uh, a little over 15 minutes. I want to go in and just do this one won't take too long. I'll go in and do a case study with these pliers. We're going to be fixing the front end of the pliers, applying a force load on the back end, and then we're going to take a look at what happens with our contacts uh, in the uh, the little pin area in the center there of the pivot, and we'll apply a a, a contact towards the, the the butt of the plier as well. So here's the setup that we're going to be reviewing. We're doing a plain carbon steel material, applying a 225 force load on each of the plier arms, and we're stabilizing the model in the front of the plier head. We're going to mesh the model, and uh, we'll take a look at results. Let me open up the uh, new file here for us. So once our model finishes loading, we're going to start a new static study. Let's say I'll call this static one. And this is our first model that we have here in our seminar that has multiple parts. So the difference here in the design tree is that we have a parts folder the parts folder has nested inside of it the three different bodies that make up the uh, the assembly. The other thing that's new or, or different is that under connections we have an automatically applied, globally applied contact and it's set to bonded. So again, this is uh, something that I, I think of as a safety net that we have inside of simulation. So it's a good practice to go in and when you're assigning contacts to all the different pieces, there's a chance you could forget one or two, right? And if you don't have a globally applied contact, then those faces are not going to know what to do and they'll just float out into space destabilizing your model. Well, with the global contact set to bonded, if those faces happen to be touching, well, then at least you'll have uh, some stability built into your study setup. So that's the idea with this global contact. And those are your two basic changes when working with a single body or a part and multiple bodies or an assembly in simulation. So we'll do a little setup here. We'll go in and we'll apply the plain carbon steel material on all the different parts. We'll apply it. And we see we have a little green check mark on all the different parts indicating that we've confirm we've applied all the different uh, materials. And um, normally I'd go in and address contacts, but we're going to be sticking with the, the, the global contact here. And we're actually going to make that change. We're going to change that to a no penetration. So I'm going to go in and edit globally and switch my contact type to no penetration. I'll click OK. There it is. So now instead of bonded, where these three parts are basically welded together as if maybe they were they were casted even into one continuous volume, now they're separate. There will be reaction forces calculated between all the contacting faces, and you'll get rea responses uh, that you'd expect there. So next, we're going to stabilize the model with some fixtures. I'll right-click and choose a uh, fixed geometry. And we'll stabilize here. We'll, we'll assume that maybe these pliers are being clamped down onto a, a piece of flat stock or something, uh, or a board. And when we apply a force load, this is not going to give, uh, is the assumption we're giving it here. Now, if the results, uh, if we cared about specifically on the results in this region, then I would probably want to add more detail, right? Which, which means I would probably add the actual board in there. I would add the no penetration contacts, and maybe stabilize somewhere else. But for us, since we care about the general stresses throughout the two plier arms, this is going to be negligible. So we'll just idealize or we'll just um, simplify by just picking a fixture there. All right, let's apply our, our particular load to the model. So we'll go into external loads and we'll apply our two force loads, one on the top, one on the bottom. And we want, uh, we said 225 newtons per item here, so per face. We'll click OK. So there's our force load. And we're pretty much done. I want to go in here and I want to mesh the model now. I want to choose a curvature-based mesh here as a good practice. And I want to I want to limit my 
uh, number of calculation nodes. So I'm going to go to mesh quality and use the draft quality mesh to get rid of the mid nodes, just to run the model a little quicker, a little simpler. We'll click OK to mesh the model. Again, super, super coarse there, but because of curvature-based mesh, it has a maximum and minimum element size. So wherever there's a curvature, you can see the element sizes shrink. Uh, to whatever the minimum value was, and then it grows uh, once it gets to an area where the model is more blocky or prismatic. All right, I'm ready to run. I'm going to save this as a good practice, and then I'll hit the Run the Study button to crunch through. Now the model is going to go through, and if I hit the More button, it's taking the majority of the time in solving the contact constraints or solving the reaction forces between the different faces of the model. Uh, I can do the same interrogation we reviewed earlier. I'm not going to um, dabble too much on that, but here's a little animation. We can see a good animation is a great way to ensure that your contacts and your bonds are all being respected. And so here we can see it's behaving as I expect. The degrees of freedom are, are, are basically um, all constrained, and we get some responses based off of the geometry. The other thing I want to mention, and this is related to the um, no penetration contact, the global contact. Under results, we have a little solver messages section or, or, or um, detail. And this tells you how many seconds the solver took to, to crunch through all of the calculation notes. And so by the time it, 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 uh, it, it uh, set up the model, established the, uh, the system of equations, and then when it started to calculate those equations, that's time zero, and it took 10 seconds to run that. Now, the reason I mention this is because I'm going to go in and I'm going to copy this particular study. I'm going to copy it. I'm going to change the name here to maybe static2. And I'm going to make one, one change to the model. Currently, it's the same exact um, setup, right? But I'm going to take this static2 study, and I'm going to edit the contact, the global contact. I'm going to go from no penetration to bonded. Now, if you remember, no penetration was the contact type that takes the most calculation resources. Bonded is basically going to just weld things together. Not very, con not very calculation intensive. OK, I need to remesh the model. We'll go ahead and redo that. And when I click remesh the model, it's going to say, hey, we're going to need to rerun the study, which we get it. So it's going to delete the current results for this particular copy. Not a big deal. We'll do that. Let it mesh, and we're going to rerun this new study, but this time with those contacts or those contacting areas bonded together. Let's see. Notice how quickly that ran. I didn't even have a chance to hit the more button to look at the details. And when I go over to the results under solver messages, I can see that it, it ran in under a fraction of a second. It went from 10 seconds to uh, under a fraction or to a fraction of a second here in this case. So again, it's um, although they're not huge calculation times, uh, comparatively speaking, there's a huge difference there between a bonded contact set and the no penetration contact set. Now, kind of scale that up to a model with hundreds of parts, you can kind of get an idea of the amount of calculation time it's going to take to run uh, your simulation to the end. All right. So this is kind of what we talked about there. We we looked at we can look at the model and we can see that the maximum stress is uh, a little under 100 megapascals. Which if we look at the yield strength of that material, uh, we're definitely fine, right? We're not yielding the the model at all. If I looked at the maximum uh, the maximum displacement plot, we're going to be displacing a little under half a millimeter for that particular force load that we applied to the model. So for this same model, I'm going to jump over to the force load, click Edit Definition, and change that from 225 newtons to 6,000 newtons. I'm going to mesh the model real quick. And now again, what I'm doing here is fundamentally violating that second assumption that we saw at the beginning of the seminar with regards to static studies, right? we're going to be forcing a large displacement to occur in a static study. Let's run it. So we get excessive displacements were calculated in this model. 
So again, it's, it's, it's looking at the ratio of the displacement, and it's going to tell us what's happening with the model here. Um, we can say cancel. If we know that you've made a mistake, maybe, maybe we didn't mean to put in 6,000 newtons. Maybe that was a, a typo, right? So we can cancel and then readdress and, and fix our study setup. If that was not a typo and we, that was intentional like we are now, uh, we have two options. We can say no and continue with the, the linear response of the model, which I do recommend. Or we can say yes and run with a, a pseudo or a partial nonlinear study type that we can run with inside of simulation static studies. Now, I don't recommend that you do that if you're starting off. Um, unless you may have some experience with nonlinear um, concepts and the workflows for nonlinear. Um, so for us, we're going to go in and do no and just stick with the linear response of the model. Now, at this point, the model looks fine, right? It looks OK. Um, but let's say that, um, but again, it's all about the interpretation of, what, of what's happening here in our design. So if we look at the model, the yield strength is 220 megapascals. Our maximum is 2,263 megapascals. So we're definitely yielding. Everything that's uh, light blue and above is yielded um, range or yielded material in our model. So it's up to us to go in and um, interpret these results. So I want to go in and edit the, the range for that particular uh, result plot. And this is a, a good practice that I recommend doing. If you know what the yield strength is, type it in as your maximum. If you're doing a static study, let's round down to 220 megapascals um, and click OK. So now we have here, we have the we have the portion of the model that has the yielded material to the to the model here. And again, you can go in and use your ISO clipping tools and, and adjust that. So you, maybe you can show 220 megapascals and show everything that has yielded from 220 megapascals and above. A great place to start maybe with a design review with your engineering team and say, okay, this thing is failing. We can't say anything about the end here because we're displacing the model. Um, but we can say that the model has definitely failed and this is the amount that it's failed at. And for most engineering applications, that's good enough, right? If it's failed, back to the drawing board. Go back to your model tab in SolidWorks, make adjustments, think about the material you're using, think about the dimensions, think about the parameters of your test, then go back to your study and then make those changes, rerun the study, and look at your results and see if they've changed or not. So that's the workflow that we use as engineers with analysis and with simulation. Uh, what else did I want to show here? So um, let's say that I, let me, let me hide this particular plot. Let's say that I wanted to, uh, to go in and I wanted to force, uh, in, in this case, you saw that the, the actual model did not touch, right? So we need to increase that value a little bit higher to force the models to touch. Now, if I were to do that, and then at that point, I would go in and I would apply a local contact to that particular region. I can select there. I can select the other face, make sure I set the no penetration, click OK, and maybe bump up the, the force load here. I guess we can do that. We, don't, we have some time. And let's say I go to six, let's say we'll do 7,000 for that. And maybe I want to apply a mesh, but I wanted to add more detail to this region. So under mesh, I can do what's called an apply mesh control, pick those two faces and then add an even smaller mesh size to that region. I can do a remesh, and then I can rerun the study. Let me, let me get rid of that ISO plot, and um, we can take a look at that region. So we can see here now that the model has actually started to touch, and then we can start to interrogate what that would be. Although I don't recommend looking at result forces there because the model has already yielded. This is a large displacement. At that point, it would be uh, the job of a, of a full nonlinear study to figure out reaction forces there uh, because the model is in the plastic deformation range. So again, that's just a taste of what you can do uh, when it comes to workflows with SOLRIC simulation with assemblies. 
Uh, let's see here. We have a couple minutes here before we uh, the end of the, the seminar. Um, here's some general rules for the hierarchy that we covered already. And I want to talk about a couple of the best practices when it comes to contacts. Uh, more specifically, to avoid the no penetration contact type with component contacts. I mentioned that you have two components, and let's say you have two very complex components with many facets, and you apply a component level contact. Well, now all those different faces have to, um, you, have, you have to set up a matrix of, of system of equations that will represent each individual combination of contact from part A to all the faces on part B and vice versa. So there's this huge combination problem and you have to figure out what they are and have slots for every single scenario that could happen, whether faces slide past each other, um, separate, partially separate, uh, etc. All, all those different scenarios. So there's a lot involved. So I recommend that you steer clear of component level contacts and do local, local no penetration contacts and not the component level no penetration contacts. If you have to, you absolutely have to. If you don't know how two parts collide with each other, that's the whole reason to use the tool. So that's perfect. But if you can avoid it, definitely use the locally applied contacts. Um, animating your models is going to be super important. Going through and uh, making sure that your, your bonded contacts are being respected is a great way uh, to do that is by animating your, 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 your individual result plots. Uh, also, the split line tool. Uh, I recommend uh, this tool. This is something you can maybe uh, you can uh, uh, f uh, Google or, or, uh, or search on YouTube the SolidWorks split line tool, and it's a tool that allows you to take a surface of the model and it allows you with a sketch of a profile and lets you separate or segregate that surface. So then you can use that new separated surface for a more specific contact region, or if you had a uh, had a certain uh, force footprint that you wanted to uh, to make sure of was being respected you could do that. Uh, a great little tool. It's a SOLIDWORKS tool, but it's great for use in all of our simulation products as well. Uh, the last thing I want to mention here is uh, applying contacts manually. Uh, you can go in um, and find a methodical way of applying all your different contacts. Go from left to right, top to bottom, and um, uh, there's a chance you're going to miss something if you just randomly attack the model in different directions. So find a, a method uh, to, to go in and, and manually address. And if you don't need to apply a contact, cool, move on to the next region of the design and address that region. If you need a contact, apply your contacts, so on and so forth. This way, you have to have a system um, of addressing the contacts. We have tools to automate that. We can apply families of contacts all in, in the fraction of a second. You can apply 3,800 contacts in two seconds, but you still have to go in and, um, as a best practice, as an analyst, go in and address to make sure it all looks correct. So a good practice is just to do it manually. Some other contact or some other best practices are more in general with regards to your, your simulations tool. So I mentioned the garbage in, garbage out principle. So this refers to the fact that we have a set of assumptions that we need to have satisfied. We have correct inputs, for example, for that, uh, for that robot dog, right? I didn't know what kind of force load to apply to the model. So I could, I just took a guess. Maybe a better thing to do would be to put a sensor on the, the if I was to recreate this in a test lab environment, put a sensor on the model and see at what force creates the same amount of force load to cause the um, the model to break or to, to, to reach that yield stress. So you could do something like that or apply um, and, and do it with sensors in a lab environment. Um, or you could use established standards. Uh, we have the, let's say, the, the mill standard, the 810 mill standard for shock testing. So we have certain uh, verified inputs that we can apply that are standard and standard practice that we can apply to the model if you're doing an a, a impulse load or a random vibration study. So uh, you can get results from that. So again, it all depends on where you source your data for your inputs. That's going to obviously affect how your outputs are going to display in simulation. Um, the other thing that you want to you want to keep in mind of is resources, R computer RAM, uh, processing speed. These are all very important aspects to the performance of your simulations in SolidWorks. So understanding how many degrees of freedom you have to calculate for, how many calculation nodes, 
um, the type of study, the other programs that are open on your computers. So if you have iTunes running or any other, maybe another engineering software then or Outlook. Outlook is a resource hog. So definitely turn off Outlook if you're running mail programs um, and only have SolidWorks running when you're going to be running your, your real uh, simulation study to calculate it. Just because all that all those resources need those uh, those cal those computer resources to run uh, efficiently. Uh, the last concept here is something we we talked about earlier in the seminar, but it's well worth to review here uh, together at the end. And this refers to the study setup and the result and mesh convergence. So I mentioned that it's a good practice to go in and simplify your models, right? Get rid of all the fi the fillet features and detail-oriented features that are not necessary. And it's also important to simplify your setup for your simulations. Like we used the draft quality mesh, we got rid of the mid-nodes on, on the calculation elements. Um, we simplified the, the force load on some of these things. Uh, and that's all fine, we get a result. And the reason we do that is because we wanna get some results, right? We don't wanna have errors, we wanna minimize the risk of errors. And once you get a model that is successful, then you start to add all the detail to it, increase your mesh quality to high quality, uh, add your custom materials, add friction to your contacts. All these different aspects will make your model more accurate and will change the result values slightly. That also, um, and so what you wanna do is you wanna add levels of detail until your results are consistent, until they reach a limit in, the, in, in what they are. The same thing goes with the mesh, so the, the mesh density of the model. You have maybe a coarse mesh and you get some results. You add a tighter mesh with, add, that adds more calculation nodes and you get a slightly different result set in the area of interest. Eventually you're going to add more and more calculation nodes and the results in the area that you're checking is not going to change. And that's how you have confidence in your results and that's how you know to stop your actual model. And again, that's one of the main concepts there that I wanted to share with you. All right, before we, uh, we end here, I just wanted to let you know that um, I highly recommend you check out uh, the Go Engineer YouTube channel. We have hundreds and hundreds of different webinars, presentations, tutorials, tips and tricks uh, that you have access to. Uh, you can subscribe and see all the new content that comes out. We have new content uh, every week, several videos and, and articles and things. Uh, so definitely check out the YouTube channel. Uh, anyway, we also have a blog. And so we have... Um, we typically add um, new articles almost every day on this thing. We're, we're super active on our, on our blog. Uh, so we have information here about SolidWorks, uh, 3D printing, um, all of our different partner products that we, we help support in, and, uh, in, in, our, in our engineering ecosystem at Go Engineer. Uh, we also uh, uh, showcase fun projects that our engineers have been doing with, uh, with 3D printing and, and 3D scanning. So uh, a lot of fun and a lot of good information is held, is held there. Also, um, there's a set of tutorials. If you're having SolidWorks, you have SolidWorks simulation installed. Um, under the tutorials, under SolidWorks simulation, we have tutorials. Uh, this is a great way to go in and start learning uh, the workflow that we covered here today. Happy holidays, everybody. It was great to, to showcase a little bit of a simulation here for you. And um, yeah, looking forward to actually meeting some of you in person after all this uh, quarantine and, uh, um, and virus stuff um, kind of subsides. So looking forward to, to actually going out to ASU and meeting everybody. So, all right, thank you very much for your time, everybody.